Hi everyone, my name is Carrie Johnson and I'm a wellness and fitness specialist for Cornell Wellness. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about plant-based nutrition. I'm really excited to see so many people register for this lecture. Uh, there was a lot of interest and that's really exciting to me. So I'm really um, happy to share this information with you. Uh, please feel free to email me after you watch this lecture. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or would like to set up an appointment one-on-one -on -one with me to figure out how plant-based nutrition can fit more easily into your life, okay? So with that being said, I will start the lecture and I'm gonna turn off this video and just share my slides with you. Okay, so plant-based nutrition. Where do you get your protein and more herbivore insight? So again, my name is Carrie Johnson and I'm a wellness and fitness specialist for Cornell Wellness. I have a degree in integrative healthcare and I spend the majority of my days doing one-on-one -on -one consultations in the areas of fitness, nutrition, behavior change, and general well-being. I also have numerous certifications, many of which include nutrition in them. Um, again, my personal training certification, we include nutrition because fitness and exercise, our nutrition and exercise go hand in hand with each other because no exercise program can fix a bad diet. Also, I'm a CrossFit coach, and the basis, the foundation of CrossFit is nutrition. Also, I have a uh, cert from the Center of Nutritional Studies in plant-based nutrition specifically, along with completing my ISSA Certified Nutritionist program. So with that being said, you know, I've had this passion and interest in fitness and nutrition my entire life, and I've been happy to do that day to day in my work environment. So I am not a registered dietitian nutritionist, though. I am not an RDN. And what separates us really is the fact that RDNs can do medical nutrition therapy. So if you're interested in going plant-based for you know, treating, reversing diabetes or heart disease or cancer, you actually would want to speak with an RDN. We do have two registered dietitian nutritionists on staff. So again, if that is of interest to you, please email me and I can set you up for an appointment with them. Today's lecture is really to kind of give you some insight into um, plant-based nutrition, kind of go over the most important nutrition factors and kind of look at some trends and everything. So it's, it's very basic. So again, either reaching out to me who has a um, certification specifically in plant-based nutrition or one of our RDNs. Now I do have something that most RDNs do not have which is 26 years of practical knowledge and experience because I've been vegan vegetarian since the age of 12. And I have lived these trends. I've had to figure out how to make this work in my own life. Um, you know, back when I was 12 in the early 90s, the closest thing we had to plant-based was tofu, veggie burgers, and soy milk. And now we live in an age where the options are endless. It's very easy to become plant-based, um, but also it's a little harder too because of all the options because there's plant-based junk food these days. And so we still need to kind of figure out how to make the healthiest choice even when you're on a plant-based diet. So I did work with our registered dietitian nutritionist on this um, lecture. They did approve these slides. So again, please feel free to reach out with me with any further questions, comments, or concerns, or sending up an individual consultation. So what is plant-based nutrition? 
a plant-based diet, the definition has changed over the years, but it's a way of eating that is built upon basic principle that we should embrace plants, such as fruits, vegetables, healthy fats, whole grains, and limit the amount of meat, dairy, eggs, and nutrient-poor foods like bleach flour and refined sugar. So it's really actually easier than most people think to create a plant-based diet because there are so many different styles of being plant-based. Like I said, when I was younger, plant-based meant that you were a vegan or a vegetarian, but today's definition is much different. As you can see, being on a plant-based diet can mean that you're clean eating, you're a pescatarian, polo-vegetarian, ovo-vegetarian, lacto-vegetarian, lacto-ovo-vegetarian, or a vegan. So that term is very much changed. So what is clean eating? It's unprocessed whole foods like organic meat, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. Now to many people, that might just sound like a typical diet, but the key term that we're looking at here is the word unprocessed, whole foods. So if you are eating meat, you're not purchasing factory farmed animals. You're buying organic meat from a sustainable source, like hunting or maybe a local farmer, or like in downtown Ithaca, we have the piggery. Whole grains. So again, unprocessed, not including white bread, white rice, whole wild grain rice, like quinoa, farro, and then whole fruits and vegetables. Pescatarian, avoid meat, but may eat fish. Polo vegetarian, avoid meat, but may eat chicken. Ovo vegetarians, avoid meat, poultry, fish, and dairy products, but do eat eggs. Lacto vegetarians, avoid meat, poultry, fish, and eggs, but consume dairy products. Lacto ovo vegetarians do not eat meat, poultry, fish, but will eat eggs and dairy. And vegans, Avoid meat, poultry, fish, eggs, dairy, gelatin, even honey, and any products derived from an animal based on moral principle. Now, I will tell you over the last 26 years, I have been all of these things. You know, I, at home, I cook, I grocery shop like I'm a vegan, but I also understand that I don't live in a vegan world. So sometimes I may eat something that has some dairy in it, or I might eat something that has some egg in it. Um, I choose not to eat meat, but that's me. And like I said, this has changed over the years. Um, and the one thing I want to really hone in and get across to people who are starting going plant-based or are very interested in going plant-based is this process is not about perfection. It's about progress. Trying to eat better, trying to be more aware of where our food comes from, making the healthiest choice available to us. It is not something that can be easily done for some people. Because we have more options, it's a great time to try to do this and try to figure out where you can see yourself in this scheme of things of becoming more plant-based. So it's an easy three-step process to go plant-based. One, eat more vegetables. Two, eat more vegetables. Three, eat more vegetables. That's really the basis of this. And as a nutritionist, as an RDN, we're all gonna tell you, eat more vegetables. I mean, that is it in our daily life. We all need to just eat more vegetables. So I'm just gonna drive that home. It's an easy three-step process. One, two, three, eat more vegetables. And then you're on your fast track to be more plant-based. Totally not rocket science here. So let's look at some trends. This is data from 2019. 
And it really shows, it's from two different studies um, that shows that dietary restrictions are not the top reason shoppers go plant-based um, and find meat alternatives. 70% of people really just wanted to improve their health. 45% of people just wanted to, you know, be what's out there. Why is this a trend? Why They're curious to see why their friends and their family members are going more plant-based. 41% was an environmental impact. 32% is ethical reasons. 27% dietary restrictions or they like the ingredients. And then price and value considerations, because it's much cheaper just to buy whole fruits and vegetables instead of buying packaged, processed, pre-cut food. So consumers today are more focused on their health and wellness. They're increasingly having food safety concerns, a growing concern for animal welfare, increased awareness of environmental sustainability, and rising prevalence of restrictive diets. So I'm just gonna go over the three main reasons people go plant-based. And that's one for the environment, two for health, and three for ethical reasons. Now, one of these is gonna stand out to us more than the other. You know, for me, my 12 year old self, it was for the ethical treatment of animals. And then down the road, I really began to learn about all the health benefits. And only about within the last 10 years, I really started learning about the environmental impact of factory farming and other environmental waste factors that affect our waterways and the land that is used. So as you can imagine, my 12 year old self in the early 90s, my parents were extremely freaked out by the fact that their daughter had gone vegan. So they sent me to a registered dietitian nutritionist um, to you know, make sure that I was going to be eating well and I wasn't gonna be living off of chips. And you know, in there, it was really interesting because even back in the 90s, when this kind of eating way was very taboo, and, you know, learning from the registered dietitian nutritionist, she was just like, yeah, just focus on whole foods, even in the early nights. And that's what we're going to tell you today, too, is focus on whole foods. Now, a lot of people are going plant-based because of the environment. You know, it's, it's a, many people feel it's a crisis and it should be more heavily viewed upon and we need more practices in place to prevent um, global warming. And then there's gonna be a lot of you that the health factor really speaks to you, hopefully because you're trying to prevent chronic illness. But you know, studies have shown that you know, plant-based diet can help treat diabetes, heart disease, cancers. So maybe you've been um, diagnosed with something and you're trying to um, treat, prevent, or treat and um, reverse an illness that you're dealing with. So one of these is gonna stand out more to each of us, but the thing is they're very intertwined. And I think once you find one, the other two may become very apparent. So let's talk about the environmental factor one of the main reasons why people are going plant-based. Our consumption of meat and dairy are stripping the earth of natural resources. The rainforest is literally being burned. The land can be cleared for cattle. Well, people are going hungry because the crops are given to the livestock instead of the human population. And the consumption of water is heavily consumed for the production of meat. So the meat industry is the number one cause of ex excess CO2 in our atmosphere. And you can actually save more water by giving up a hamburger than a year's worth of showers. Locally, 
Our own lake has experienced algae blooms due to agricultural runoffs from local farms, which is the number one pollutant of our waterways according to the Environmental Protective Agency. So beet production accounts for more than half of greenhouse gas emissions, according to the study of World Watch Institute, which tally that methane gas and CO2 emissions from livestock and the energy used in processing and distributing meat products. 80% of the world's agricultural land is used up by livestock, and 40% of the production of corn, wheat, and rice is gone to feed them. 80% of the U.S. water is used for agriculture, which means reducing meat from your diet can have a bigger impact on the environment than taking shorter stop showers or installing a more efficient toilet. Did you know it takes 1,850 gallons of water per one pound of beef? It takes four, 520 gallons of water to produce one pound of chicken and only 43 gallons of water to produce one pound of vegetable or that a 2,000 calorie diet, including high meat consumption, produces two and a half times as many greenhouse gas emissions as a vegan diet, and twice as many as a vegetarian. So on the left, I have you know, a little graph um, about the Beyond Burger and the Beef Burger. And the reason why I use the Beyond Burger is because it's a processed product. It's a processed hamburger uh, made from vegetables but I'm not one to really promote processed foods. But I just wanted to kind of show you that, you know, the beef burger, the crops are grown to feed the animals, the cows are fed and raised, and they have to go to the slaughterhouse, and then the process of making the burger and just packaging and distributing them so that you can bring them home to cook. Similarly, the Beyond Burger, the crops are just grown for just the burger. So we've kind of taken out this extra step on um, the burgers are made and beyond burgers are made in a heating cooling sustainable um, factory and then they're you know packaged and shipped and distributed the difference is a burger that is made without meat produces 99 percent less water use it is 93 percent less land use there are 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and it uses 99% less energy. This is why we have this Beyond Burger or Impossible Burger craze right now, because the proof is in the numbers. Just from one hamburger, the amount of water, land, greenhouse emissions, and energy is almost 100%. So although it is a craze, it's, um, you know, it's not, it's still processed food, but, you know, it's helping factor in so many environmental things that really need to be occurring right now on our planet. So health benefits. It lowers your risk of prostate, breast, and other cancers. You can prevent reverse heart disease, along with prevent, reverse, and treat diabetes. Uh, people are losing a lot of weight, have more energy, and live longer. It's scientifically significant that vegans and vegetarians live longer than people who consume meat. You know, also, switching to a plant-based diet will improve your digestion, increase your fiber, reduces risk of chronic disease, boosts your energy, gives you healthy skin, hair, and nails, easily lose weight, support our environmental health, which directly affects us. So what the health? There's so many things I just listed, you know, in the benefit of eating a plant-based diet. So on your left is a or in the left hand per se, you know, it's pizza, burgers, fried food, hot dogs, processed, 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 processed food. Also known as a typical Western American diet. Usually at some point throughout the, of the week, Americans engage in eating pizza, French fries, hot dogs, 
fried chicken and burgers. That's very typical in our society. Also a direct link, correlation to obesity, heart disease and cancers. On the right hand are whole fruits and vegetables. On the right hand is what we're trying to strive to achieve more of on a plant-based diet. So diving a little bit more into the health benefits um, in relation to chronic disease and a typical Western diet. In America, heart disease kills 600,000 people a year. That's one in every four deaths. America's number one killer is heart disease, and it doesn't discriminate against men or women. America's number two killer is cancer, and 30% of cancers are dietary related. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States. Again, 30% of cancers in Western countries are dietary related. We all know someone who has been affected by cancer. Animal products are the main source of saturated fat and cholesterol. Studies show that a low fiber or a low fat, high fiber plant-based diet can help to reduce the risk of heart disease. Cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Two large prospective study, studies have each shown that vegans have 20% lower risk of cancer than meat eaters. Vegans also have a 62% lower risk of developing type two diabetes than meat eaters. Vegetarians have been found to have 32% lower risk of heart disease. It really comes back to those original philosophies of you are what you eat. What we eat can either produce disease or unlock vitality and health. Every time you put something on your plate, every time you put something on your, in your mouth, you have a choice. And next time you go to make those decisions, I really want you to think, how is this meal going to affect my health? Is what I'm about to eat going to produce high cholesterol and high fat, which is going to have a direct effect on the blood in my body and the arteries in my heart? Is this meal that I'm about to eat going to inhibit the rate of cancer or have an opposite effect? The last thing, or one of the last reasons that people are really switching over to plant-based diet is for the ethical treatment of animals. Plant-based diets are not just healthy, but they are humane. Animals are much more intelligent and complex than most people realize. Scientists are providing more and more data all the time. According to researchers, cows enjoy mental challenges and active play with a ball and have the ability to complete obstacle and agility courses. Scientists now know that pigs have the cognitive skills above a three-year-old child. Biologists write that fish have complex cultural traditions. And chickens form friendships, social hierarchies, and cultural knowledge passed between generations. Today, animals, all of these animals that I just mentioned, live on factory farms. They feel pain and are crammed into inhumane living conditions, while dogs and cats share our homes. So there's a lot of hypocrisy in animal advocacy. You know, we rush to save dogs overseas from meat markets. We save the ocean by stop using straws, but we continue to eat the fish out of them. 
We stopped buying canola oil to save the orangutans, but the rainforest is getting bulldozed. You know, going vegan is a way to live with compassion, nonviolence. And I don't want us to forget about the people that have to work in these conditions amongst the animals on factory farms. I don't think that's something we want for our fellow humans either. You know, it affects our planet and of course it affects animals. If you really want to help and save animals, stop eating them. You could save eight animals without eating them in a month, 100 in a year and 300 in three years. So, you know, going back to, you know, we love one but not the other. I think from a young age at our own dinner tables with our family. We are taught from a young age to value certain lives over another. And I think from that point, it then spills out into our society where that same thing happens. Valuing someone else's life over another. So if you are plant-based or going to go plant-based, the number one people are going to ask you is, but where do you get your protein? But unfortunately, the real question you should ask back is, where do you get your fiber? 97% of people in this country get enough protein. And the majority of us get way more protein than we ever need. On the other hand, only 3% 3% of people get enough fiber, which is a direct correlation with chronic disease, not having enough fiber in your diet. Because earlier when we looked at that hand with the pizza and the burgers and the fried food and the hot processed hot dog, there are no fiber in a typical Western diet because we get our fiber from plants. So one major myth that I want to break right now is that protein does not equal meat. Protein is a macronutrient that is, in, that is found in every single food that we eat. Everything we eat has protein, carbohydrates, and fat. We need all those things. So don't worry about not getting enough protein on a plant-based diet. Just let that whole thing go. What I want you to continue to strive to do is increase the fiber in your diet. And how do we do that? We eat more vegetables and fruits. So did you know 100 calories of steak equals 8 grams of protein and 7.4 grams of fat? 100 calories of broccoli equals 11.1 grams of protein and 0.4 grams of fat. Plus, it has phytochemicals, vitamins, essential nutrients that prevent disease and promote health. Now, the big thing I really want you to realize between the steak and the broccoli is not that broccoli has more protein. I really want you to look at the fat grams here because what is leading to this chronic disease is the high concentration of animal fat, the saturated fat that we're putting into our bodies that goes directly into our bloodstream that has a direct effect on our organs. Eliminating this saturated fat from our diet is one of the quickest ways to promote health in our bodies and prevent disease. Now we need good fats that come from avocados and oils, but the saturated fats that come from animal-based products is no bueno, not any good. So like I was saying before, protein is a macronutrient. It does not equate to meat. So when you eat, you're always eating something with protein. But some of the top sources of veggie protein come straight from vegetables, like spinach is 49% protein. The rest is made up by carbohydrates 
and fat, along with some phytochemicals, essential nutrients, and vitamins, minerals. Kale, 45% fat, and it goes on and on. So a lot of vegetables are almost 50% protein, which is pretty awesome. So protein in meat, beef is 25.8% protein. And then the other half of that though, is gonna be saturated fat. Chicken, 23% and eggs, 12%. We all know that eggs are very high in cholesterol, high in saturated fat. And so only 12% of that egg is gonna be protein. So just remember, protein does not equate to meat. Protein equates to a mac macronutrient, which is found in everything along with carbohydrates and fat. So another thing that I think is a big myth is calcium equals dairy products. Again, calcium does not equal dairy. Calcium equals a micronutrient, which is a mineral. So we can also get a lot of calcium from foods like sesame seeds, spinach, collard greens, blackstrap molasses, kelp, tahini, broccoli, Swiss chard, kale, Brazil nuts, celery, almonds, papaya, flax seeds, oranges, just to name a few. Calcium does not equal dairy. Calcium equals a micronutrient. It's a mineral found in many plant-based foods. So one thing I want you to be aware of when going um, plant-based is a vitamin called B12. So there's plenty of vegan uh, B12 sources. Um, Always in my fridge is nutritional yeast. I pretty much sprinkle it on everything. Um, and in all the blood work I've ever had done, I've never been B12 or protein deficient. Um, most plant-based drinks are fortified with B12. Tempeh, which is like a grain, um, is, has natural occurring B12. Fortified breakfast cereals, LG seaweed, mushrooms, root vegetables, and of course, purple ones. Um, the only time I do supplement with B12, because I'm just very conscious of the way that I eat, is if I'm training for an event. Um, most people who know me know that I do Olympic weightlifting competitions, I do CrossFit competitions, I do trail running competitions, Oh, you name it. I, I, I love a good competition. So those are the few times that I actually do increase my B12 um, and also essential fatty acids um, to, and to make sure that I'm getting enough because I'm performing at a higher level of intensity. And I will supplement with a vitamin B12, like New Chapter or My Kind Organics. Um, but that's really only probably within like the eight weeks leading up before um, a competition just because my training is really at the highest peak. So symptoms of B12 deficiency are constant fatigue, constipation, little to no appetite, hence the unplanned weight loss, numbness and tingling sensations, dizziness, soreness of the mouth and tongue, and problems with balance. Now, you can have a B12 deficiency and not be on a plant-based diet. So B12, you don't need a lot of it, but it does a lot for our bodies. So when we're talking in the milligrams um, for the amount that you need. So we can easily attain enough B12 by, you know, drinking fortified milks, um, cereals, eating mushrooms or seaweed snacks. And my go-to, obviously, I love nutritional yeast. It was not my favorite when I first tried it, but now it just goes on everything. Um, so if you are an athlete or you do competitions, just consider maybe increasing B12 by supplement. And like I said before, you don't have to be on a plant-based diet to experience B12 deficiency. So just kind of look out for the signs. If you're feeling any of those, 
even if you're a meat eater, um, you may have a B12 deficiency and you might want to just consciously plan on uh, increasing that through the use of food, fortified foods. So 50% of our plate should be fruits and vegetables. So there's a lot going on in the screen, but essentially what I have here are five different plates that are recommended by various councils that show that 50% of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. So the blue image is the Mediterranean diet, which if you're into diets, I would not recommend. It what is the, called the healthiest diet that you could be on. Why? Because it really puts you into a good eating habit. It's helping you create this habit of sustainability and healthy eating. The lower, the smaller plate underneath that is actually the food plate from Canada, which they recommend, which is exactly the same as the Mediterranean diet above. The middle is healthy eating plate from Harvard School of Public Health. The plate, smaller plate in the upper right hand corner is my plate from us.gov. So that's what our government recommends our plates look like. And below that is a plant-based, vegan, plant-based diet, vegetarian plate. So they are all, five of these are showing that vegetables and fruit should be 50% of our plate. So when you sit down to eat, that is what it should look like. And it's great to learn this visualization because when we sit down to eat, you can automatically analyze what you are about to consume. Is 50% of my plate fruits and vegetables, 25% whole grains, and 25% a healthy protein? If not, we just need to reconfigure our plate. So healthy protein. You can choose fish, poultry, beans, nuts. Just make sure that you limit red meat and cheese. And according to the World Health Association, avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meat because they are noted to be carcinogenic to our bodies. Now, what is a healthy protein? Well, think about it should fit in the palm of your hand. That is the size of your protein. So either the pile of beans, the handful of nuts, uh, the size of the fish, or the poultry should be the size of your palm or the size of a deck of a cards. It's about four ounces. So those of you who go out and order that 14 ounce steak, we now know that we can cut that into several different meals. When it comes to whole grains, eat a variety. There's so many out there. Try something new and try something new often. Uh, make sure the first word is whole wheat or whole grain, like bread and pasta and brown rice, wild rice, quinoa, farro, and limit refined grains like white rice and white bread. Eat plenty of fruits of all different colors. Um, I include my son in grocery shopping, and when we go to the grocery store, he has to pick two new vegetables than he did last time, and he has to pick one fruit. And if he, if I hadn't had him do this, he would never know how much he loves star fruit, and neither would I. The more vegetables and the greater variety, the better. Potatoes don't really count because they're a really starchy vegetable, um, and french fries definitely don't count, right, because they're saturated with fats. But speaking of fats, we really want to make sure that we're including healthy oils like olive oil for cooking, on salad, at the table. Limit butter and avoid trans fat. Now you can see three, actually four, the Canadian one includes the two. Um, I don't have it on there, but they say water. They drink water instead of dairy. Only the US Gov, my plate, has dairy as our drink. But we should be drinking a ton of water. If you already are drinking water, great, drink more water. Or have tea, coffee, but try to limit the amount of sugar 
You put it, limit the amount of dairy to one to two servings a day and juice, just one small glass a day. And make sure that you're avoiding those sugary drinks like sodas. Going back, when you look at your plate, it should look something like this. Now in the lower right corner, the vegan vegetarian plant-based plate, again, a lot of fruits and vegetables, 20% whole grains, legumes for our protein, and seeds and nuts. This is the number one thing I recommend for people to go who are going plant-based is start buying seeds and nuts galore. Sprinkle it everywhere because that's where you're really gonna get those omega-3s, those essential fatty acids, and they're really just going to kind of up your diet. In my pantry, I just have this little basket and it's full of macadamia nuts, chia seeds, sunflower seeds, flax meal I keep in the fridge and I just sprinkle that on things almonds, cashews, peanuts. It's just this whole thing, uh, just full of nuts and seeds. And I keep that packed in my pantry and I just put it on everything because it's a really important thing when you go plant-based to up those in your diet. So the amount of things you can eat is pretty wide. I mean, we're just going to focus on whole, unrefined plants. It's really cheap to do too, because you're not paying for the processing, the packaging, somebody pre-cutting, just go buy some fruits and vegetables. You know, my grocery shopping really consists of walking in the front door of Wegmans and then going to check out. I don't really go around the store too much because what I need is right in front of me when you first walk in. I do go to the bulk food section. There's my, it's where I get my grains and my, my legumes and stuff. Um, but whole grains, um, barley, brown rice, teff, millet, wild rice, quinoa, amaranth, steel cut and road oats, whole wheat, and corn. Corn is actually a grain, it's not a vegetable. Legumes, so many different things you can eat. Um, dried or canned, um, make sure you purchase one with lower sodium or minimal salt. So many different things. My favorite is lentils, uh, especially red lentils. I really just keep them soaked and I use them frequently. It's kind of like nutritional yeast. I just add them to everything. Salads, whatever we're eating. I make lentil, red lentil sloppy joes. Um, Chickpeas, I use the aquafaba, the, the chickpea water to make things. Um, I also put them on everywhere and make them into anything. Um, green beans, mung beans, I love great northern white beans, lima beans, pinto beans, make homemade veggie burgers. Now greens, you know, you can buy them fresh, but they're not going to last very long. Um, so buying frozen is a really cost-effective way of getting greens. And when they're frozen, they really hold their nutrients for quite a long time, or they're gonna hold more nutrients than um, being canned. So kale, collards, spinach, lettuce, parsley, cilantro, chard, bok choy, arugula, roots. I love the fall for root vegetable season. So many other veggies to choose from. Fruit, now fruit we can do again, fresh or frozen, just because that frozen is gonna really can, uh, hold more nutrients. Apricots, you can get dried fruit too is another great option. And like I was saying earlier, the omega-3 rich seeds are flaxseed. Now to get the nutrients out of flaxseed, you do need it ground into a meal uh, or the powder. Chia seeds are great, sunflower seeds are great. Spices life, get, new spices, trial kinds of things. I'm into spicy spices. Um, everybody's usually amazed at how my son likes to eat jalapenos, but that's just the way I cook. So he, he's just, ever since he was in the womb, has been eating spicy food. So he's really into it. Um, beverages, so many different beverages out there today. I was in PNC Fresh the other day um, and I just went to go buy some hemp milk because it's really high in protein also, and it's really high in calcium. But you know, they have almond milk, macadamia nut milk, rice milk, banana milk, coconut milk, 
Um, the, the list went on and on. And I was just looking at this shelf of plant-based drinks and I was like, wow, this, this industry has really exploded. Oat milk. I'm a huge fan of oat milk in my coffee these days. It's really creamy. I really like the flavor of it. So some simple steps. I know this is like a lot of information and you're thinking, well, what, what do I do with this now? How do I get started? Um, let's not make things complicated. You know, let's start with step one, eat more vegetables. Try to get vegetables into your breakfast. Sometimes that's like a really obscure thought to people. Um, having a savory breakfast, how do we get it in there? Eat raw vegetables, eat them as a snack. Think about increasing that fiber, what vegetables are gonna do for you. Um, you know, bring some dip, bring some hummus, you know, have them cut up and already easy to grab in your fridge. Try meatless Mondays. Or there's also vegan January where you go vegan for the whole month. But to start, let's try meatless Mondays and where you don't have any meat the whole day. Make a salad a meal. Just really put in those nuts and seeds and beans and lettuce and vegetables and pack it full of good, good stuff. Make a smoothie, or my favorite, a green smoothie. Um, this is pretty much a staple in our household for snacks or you know, to include with breakfast. It's a really way to become nourished and really pack in a lot of nutrients and phytonutrients into a cup. They're super tasty too. Um, begin to swap out your dairy you know, for oat milk or hemp milk or almond yogurt or Another big industry boom was um, vegan and vegetarian plant-based cheeses. I'll tell you what, back in the 90s, that did not exist. And I, I've seen it go through the phase of they had some plant-based cheeses, but I did, I did not want to eat them. But now they have some really amazing artisan cheeses that are phenomenal. I had um, my colleague Ruth made this almond based, oh no, it's cashew based pate. And it, it blew my mind because it was so, so good. Um, then you can try stuff like only add meat to one meal a day. So you go the whole day and only one of your meals, either breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or maybe even a snack just has meat in it. Uh, only add meal, meat to one meal a week. Then go to only add meat to one meal a month. Just try new things, you know? And I want you to think back about the variations of different plant-based diets there are. So if you wanna go plant-based, but you know, you, you wanna hold on to eggs or you do wanna hold on to cheese or you do wanna hold on to chicken or fish or whatever, it's okay. All of that is okay, it all works. This is living and it can change at any time. All I want you to remember is I want you to eat more vegetables. I want you to try new things. I want you to be conscious of what you're eating and make the healthiest choice available to you. So a lot of people um, have reached out to me after watching the Game Changers documentary, uh, which I thought was very well produced because it really combated the myth that people who are plant-based, vegan or vegetarian are frail and that we have deficiencies and we don't get enough protein. You know, that documentary was based on performance athletes and how that they have actually become faster, stronger, better athletes once they switched over to plant-based. And like the Tennessee Titans, their whole entire professional NFL football team has become plant-based because they're seeing the results and better performance out of these athletes. So the entire team has made the switch. Now, some things, some other documentaries I would like you guys to check out uh, going along with the environmental reasons, the health reasons, and the ethical reasons of becoming more plant-based are these three documentaries. The first one is Cowspiracy, and it's about the sustainable science and how factory farming and the meat industry is affecting our planet in a negative way. 
Forks Over Knives is known as the film that can save your life. It is steeped in research, it's very scientific. Um, anybody who loves data will love this documentary. It's convincing, it's radical, it's just a great movie. And I'm a big fan of their website and their cookbooks, but Forks Over Knives will take you inside the health factors um, and what food does to our bodies. And the last documentary is Earthlings. Um, it's a multi-award winning documentary and it's really about nature, animals, and humankind. And we're all connected. And we get going busy, busy in our daily lives and we forget about how connected to this earth we should be, how much connected to this earth we used to be. And we've changed. And just kind of taking a closer look on how we all are connected and we should strive to be more connected once again. So some resources for you are nutritionstudies.org. This is the organization that I actually got my plant-based nutrition certification from. Nutritionfacts.org, again, all research-based. Uh, it's a phenomenal website, lots of data, lots of facts, lots of studies. Um, so the first two are really the resources of where I got the slides to present this to you. Uh, like I said, forksoverknives.com, really, really great site, tons of knowledge, great for families, great for anybody who has kids, great for anybody wanting to start going plant-based. They even have starter kits that they'll mail to you. Um, PCRM.org is um, a physician site for creating more whole medicine and not just treating patients' symptoms with prescriptions. It's about a whole food, plant-based, um, physician-led, research-based site. And I really like this site because I feel like this is where medicine is heading. You know, we've already seen the changing um, through our nutrition requirements and recommendations and physicians making the change into providing better healthcare. Today, a medical student will only receive 24 credit hours of nutrition education. And we're, they're really starting to see the shift in providing more nutrition education for physicians. My favorite website, blogger, cook, is theminimalistbaker.com. And her philosophy is you're gonna create a meal in 30 minutes or less, you're gonna use 10 ingredients or less, and you're gonna have one bowl. And as a busy person, as a mom, this site, I've turned so many people on to it. I've compared recipes with people, I've gotten people excited about this website. It really is my go-to um, cookbook, you know, cook site. It's where I make my dinners from, it's where I bring my meals for potlucks and events. Um, it's how I cook for the holidays. It's got something for everybody and it's so simple and streamlined and easy. If you are not a cook, you can do this. It's really great. So three books that I would highly recommend reading is How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger and the nutritionfacts.org website also is by him and that's where I got the majority of the information for this lecture. Um, so it's a New York Times bestseller and it's pretty scientifically proven ways to prevent and reverse disease through food. Um, and it's got the basis of what you eat every day can add years to your life but it can also take away from them if you don't choose wisely. 
A national bestseller is the China study, and it's the most comprehensive study of nutrition ever conducted. It has startling implications for diet, weight loss, and long-term health. And it's also known as um, the China Cornell Oxford Project. And it was done over the course of 20 some years. It's really riveting information. It really shows the negative effects of animal consumption and how it's associated with chronic disease. Um, one thing I took um, on a, uh, from a side project of the China study is they were in the Philippines and they had these malnourished children. And of course, what do Westerners think? They need more protein. So they put these children on a high protein animal-based diet, because that's where you get protein from, right? And what happened was in the Philippines, they had a rocketing spike in childhood cancers. The last book that I love is the No Me Athlete Cookbook. Um, this is just really easy and fun and colorful and things I've never tried before. And it's based on whole food, plant-based recipes to fuel your workouts and the rest of your life. Um, it's by Matt Frazier, who you know, ran the Appalachian Trail, the fastest world record ever. He's an ultra marathoner, so he runs 50 plus miles for fun. And so he has an understanding of a uh, endurance, high intensity athlete, and not many of us live to that capacity. So if this type of food can make him run longer and faster, only like, can you imagine what it could do for you? So I highly recommend this cookbook. It's fun. It's so fun. And the food is just to die for. So thank you so much for tuning in with me today. I hope you enjoyed the information that I presented. And I hope you'll reach out to me at kaj84 at cornell.edu or give me a call in my office. I'd be happy to meet with you and figure out a way for plant-based to you know, easily come into your life and figure out some solutions of things that you may be challenged with. Also, if you are wanting to go plant-based for a chronic disease or for um, treatment of a chronic disease, please reach out to me and I can also pair you up with one of our dietitian nutritionists who can then counsel you on medical nutrition therapy. So I hope you guys will let me know since we weren't able to meet in person if um, there's any feedback about my slides or the presentation or the information you received, please reach out to me with any questions, comments, or concerns or more information that you would like to attain for your personal self. I am so happy to do that and meet with you and discuss this further. So again, my name is Carrie Johnson, wellness and fitness specialist. Thank you so much for joining. And I hope all of you take a moment and try to eat a little healthier. So Take care. Bye-bye.